welcome Dan Spears. He's the VP of Industry Relations with BMI, and he is here to talk a little bit about music licensing for us. Thank you, Hope, and um, Eric, and the whole team at the PRLA. I've, we've had a wonderful partnership over the years, and uh, we're very grateful for that. And so when I have a chance to get in front of the membership and hopefully educate you on a subject matter that most would probably not say is very sexy, uh, we're going to try and bring sexy back today and make music licensing something fun to talk about. Well, maybe I'm overreaching with that, but we're going to do our best to educate you so that you, you're you armed with knowledge the next time you have to deal with a copyright related issue as it applies to music in your establishment. Um, so here's what we're going to cover today. Um, we'll start with the foundation for all of this, which is the copyright law. And then I think um, what's going to be hopefully very valuable to you is we're going to talk about the various performing rights organizations who they represent, how they operate. So when they do call, you're operating from a position of strength, that you understand who they are, who they represent, so that you can make the right decision about license agreements for your establishment. Um, talk a little bit about how BMI collects and distributes the fees that you pay. We'll talk about this wonderful discount program we have the, with the PRLA. Um, what's licensable in your respective venue? Um, We'll also touch on the current BMI license that exists for restaurants and bars. And then my least favorite slide is talking about what happens if you don't license, because there is this copyright law, as I indicated, that kind of is the foundation for this. And uh, it can be very costly if you choose to ignore inquiries from performing rights organizations when you have music in your establishment. So just briefly, you know, copyright law created by Congress to support and protect intellectual property. And that covers a wide range of, of creative fields, whether it's music, whether it's photography, uh, literary works. All of this is considered intellectual property under the copyright law and is protected. Um, it's, you know, I always use this as an analogy when it comes to getting a better understanding of the public performance of music. Um, people can relate to watching a movie and it says very specifically on there that that movie is licensed only for private home viewing. Uh, and that's the difference between public performance and private performance, right? Uh, private is something you're doing in the confines of your home. Public is when music or a movie is is in uh, a public setting. Now the copyright law covers a variety of uh, different areas within the music side of things. We call it the bundle of music rights within the copyright law. I just wanna talk about a few of them just to give you kind of a broad understanding of music rights um, and how songwriters, publishers are protected uh, when it comes to their musical works. So the first one is called the, the mechanical right. And many of you might be familiar with that. That's when a, a digital download takes place, or even in this day and age, people are buying vinyl. Um, every time that happens, a small piece of the sale of that particular uh, piece of music, again, whether it's digitally downloaded or purchased physically, a piece of that goes to the publisher and the songwriter. It's not a whole lot. Uh, it used to be more. Uh, it used to be that uh, people bought albums. And so if you wrote a song that was on an album and that album was a multi-platinum selling album, then you as a songwriter would get a pretty good revenue stream from that. Um, it didn't matter if the song was a single and was on radio or on TV uh, because the album was selling so much that you made money off the mechanicals. It doesn't happen anymore, really, because albums just aren't a thing. Uh, it's, all, it's an all singles world. Mm. Then there's the sync right that's held by the songwriter and the publisher. The synchronization right is when you, you know, let's say you wanted to use a commercially successful song that you love in a commercial for your restaurant or your bar or your hotel. Um, you would be required to actually go to the publisher who owns the copyright to that song and negotiate what's called a synchronization right, which is the right to sync music with video. 
I think it's important to define what a publisher is because we're going to be talking about publishers a lot. I think we all know what a songwriter is. A publisher owns the copyright to a particular song. Uh, so what happens is I'm a songwriter in Nashville. I write a song or I write a collection of songs. I then affiliate, hopefully, with a publishing company. Now, that publishing company, in exchange for affiliating my works, they actually take on ownership of those songs. They become the copyright owner. And most would say, well, why would a songwriter give up ownership of their songs? Um, well, the reason is because uh, publishing companies serve as agents for songs. They're the ones that help get those songs recorded by artists um, in a film, in a television show. They bring life to that song. And so in exchange for doing that work, they are taking ownership of it. And they are splitting those royalties with the songwriters. So when I mention publishers and songwriters, you at least have a better idea what a publisher is. Uh, then there's the right to perform publicly. And that's really what's most germane to this conversation. It's called the public performance right. And again, as I mentioned before, it's defined as any group of people outside of a normal circle of family and friends. Um, and this would mean, for example, if you had a wedding at your restaurant or hotel, that would not require licensing because that is considered a private performance. But if you had Thursday night singer songwriter playing that, uh, you know, in front of your, your, your customers, that's a public performance. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. So the role that a company like BMI plays, which is a performing rights organization is we are the middle person between those that write songs um, and those that perform that music. Uh, as a songwriter, it'd be impossible for you to go to every business that plays your music, whether it's a radio station, a bar, a hotel, a restaurant, and negotiate a fee for that. So instead, you affiliate. Um, early in your career, you make a conscious decision to affiliate with a performing rights organization. You grant them the right to represent your music and license it to businesses. I used to call this slide circle of life at BMI until someone told me it's a square of life. So this is the square of life. This is kind of what the music ecosystem looks like within places like Nashville. You know, a songwriter will affiliate with a company like BMI, as I mentioned. Those names that you see are very recognizable because those are examples of artists who actually are very prolific songwriters as well. But to be honest with you, most of the songwriters we represent, you've never heard of. They're behind the scenes. They're anonymous. They go in every day, punch a time clock, trying to write hit songs. Um, for Blake Shelton or George Strait, you name it, and you've not heard of their names, most of them. So they, they, they affiliate with BMI. We go out and we license the businesses that use the music. We collect the licensing fees from the businesses. Um, we then track those performances. A lot of it's through Shazam technology to determine how often a song is performed. And then we send a royalty check out um, every quarter to our songwriters and publishers that represents and shows exactly where their music was played, whether it was in a, uh, uh, on a radio station, Spotify, internationally, what have you. So here is the part of the presentation that I think is, I don't know if it's the most important, but it's the top two or three most important thing for you to understand. And that is these companies that these songwriters and publishers choose to affiliate to represent their works when it comes to the public performance. The first is ASCAP. Um, they have been around the longest. They were created in 1914. Um, they're a not-for-profit membership-based society. Between ASCAP and BMI, we're talking about 90% of the market. 90% of music played on radio and bars, hotels, and restaurants today is represented collectively by either ASCAP or BMI. Now, BMI was created in 1939 um, for two reasons. One, ASCAP was a monopoly, and the biggest consumer of music at the time was the radio industry. And they got tired of ASCAP because they were a monopoly, increasing the licensing fees that radio would pay by 100% on an annual basis. The other thing that was going on that was troubling to the radio industry was that all these new forms of music uh, was coming in from Appalachia. If you ever watched the movie uh, about the country music industry that Ken Burns did, they talk about the Appalachian music and it's it, bursting on the scene in the late 30s. Well, the radio industry could not play that music on their radio stations 
because there was no copyright compliance mechanism. Now, the reason why there wasn't is because ASCAP only would affiliate songwriters if they had at least two established hits on the radio. So for those new writers coming from Appalachia, bursting on the scene, they couldn't get their music played on radio. It was a catch-22 because radio refused to play it without any way to clear the copyright. ASCAP refused to affiliate them because they didn't have two established hits on the radio. So BMI, in addition, you know, in addition to the fact that there was a, a, a monopoly that ASCAP was uh, basically taking advantage of by increasing fees, BMI also wanted this new music to come out. So the radio industry created the company. They sold shares of stock for seed money, and BMI was formed to not only create a competitive music source and bring the rates down, but also to open the door to new forms of music. So BMI from the very outset did not have a requirement that you needed two established hits on the radio. Free to join BMI, open the door to new forms of music. That's why if you look back at uh, 1939, early 1940s, BMI had a lot to do with the explosion of music, new music on the, uh, the American uh, music scene. So, you know, the Muddy Waters, the Chuck Berries, uh, the Little Richards, they're all BMI songwriters because they were there at the beginning when BMI had this open door policy. Now, here's another thing you need to know that's really important is that BMI and ASCAP operate under Justice Department consent decrees that were written back in the 1960s for antitrust purposes. I won't go through the whole consent decree. There's one element of the consent decree that's important to you as a restaurant or hotel executive, and that is we must treat similarly situated businesses in a similar fashion, which means we have standard agreements for all the industries that we serve. We cannot negotiate those fees. So if you get a call from ASCAP or BMI about a license, those fees that they're quoting you are set in stone. We are prohibited by law from negotiating those fees because if we offered one rate to a restaurant in Harrisburg, we'd have to offer that same rate to the restaurant in Philadelphia. So remember that about ASCAP and BMI. Consent decrees can't negotiate. CSAC, a different animal. Small company represents maybe three to 5% of the market out there, but they've got some fairly high profile songwriters that there's a really good chance that your businesses might be uh, performing in your establishments. Um, they do not operate under a consent decree. You can negotiate with them. And they sometimes come in pretty hot with a very aggressive uh, fee quote, and uh, I would push back on that. If their fee that they're quoting you is similar to BMI or ASCAP or even close to what BMI and ASCAP are charging you, you need to push back because we're talking about a small percentage of, of the market share, whereas ASCAP and BMI each represent, what, BMI 50-something percent, ASCAP upper 40s. Uh, obviously, doesn't make sense for you to you know, pay that much for a product that you're not using as much as you would be ASCAP and BMI's catalogs. Uh, another small company, but with a catalog that's fairly high profile, this was created, Global Music Rights, in 1913, invitation only to join by uh, well-known music industry executive Irving Azoff, former manager of the Eagles. He said, I'm going to create a performing rights organization that businesses cannot do without. We're going to create a catalog that's so powerful, and then we're going to also charge it, charge charge you for it, uh, in a way that is uh, probably more aggressive than other PROs have in the past. So they brought Bruce Springsteen, Pharrell Williams, Bruno Mars, a bunch of high-profile songwriters, most of them from ASCAP, over to GMR, paid them a fair amount of money to come on board, and they are now aggressively licensing that catalog. They focused primarily at the outset on the low-hanging fruit, the bigger, biggest consumers of music, which uh, is broadcasters, so radio in particular. So you may hear from them from time to time. They're not reaching out to all restaurants and bars. We're not quite sure what their strategy is, but if you do hear from them, you do need to talk to them and you need to push back if their uh, rate quote is, uh, like I said, is is uh, on par with BMI and ASCAP because they only represent a small piece of the industry, but what they do represent is fairly high profile. So now there's this fifth performing rights organization that maybe you've not heard of before, but I want you to keep it in the back of the mo your mind in case you do hear from them. I know this is frustrating for everybody that's on this call. It's frustrating for me 
um, because I hear from you all uh, and I understand the challenges of hearing from yet another performing rights organization. Like, hey, when is this going to stop? You know, how many performing rights organizations are there going to be, uh, you know, five or 10 years from now? I don't know. It's pretty hard to have a performing rights organization. You have to have a pretty, pretty uh, robust infrastructure to not only license all of those businesses, but then track the performances, make the royalty distributions. All track was created uh, a few years ago. They represent primarily independent artists. Um, is your business using all track? Boy, you know, I, I you know there's, there's a fine line here. I have to be careful because all track. Uh, they do what we do. Their job is to make sure songwriters are fairly compensated, that intellectual property is respected. What I would advise you to do with all track, as well as all these performing rights organizations, is make sure you get an understanding of what it is that they represent. You know, all track, because they only represent primarily independent artists and songwriters, uh, there are a lot of businesses that don't use the product. In fact, in the in the you know, in the restaurant and hotel industry, um, you know, I I think you need to tell Alltrack if they reach out to you. I want a list of your most performed songs in your catalog. I want a list of those commercially viable, successful songs that you represent. Uh, because you don't want to take a license with a company that offers a product that you don't need. And um, I th it's true for all those performing rights organizations. Know what it is that you're paying for. BMI and ASCAP have a huge database called SongView where you can look in there and see what we represent, who owns the songs, who are they published through, who are the co-writers, all of that. CSAC's got a, a searchable database um, as well. But again, the new player is Alltrack. Make sure that you vet them uh, before you choose to do business with them. Find out what they represent and make sure that your business needs their product. So the BMI license agreement is a blanket agreement, which means it covers all forms of music. It covers karaoke, DJs, live bands. Um, the fees are determined based upon the size of the business and the frequency of music use. Really the fire code number is the foundation for determining the fees. And then there's an a la carte report that you check off. Yes, I have live music. Yes, I have karaoke, DJ, what have you. You know, the average rate that a, a restaurant anyways pays BMI is, you know, somewhere around $400 a year. So we're not talking a huge amount of money. But the benefit of a license agreement with a company like BMI is that you don't have to license these songs individually. You, at BMI, you have access to over 20 million songs. Um, 100, uh, 1 1.3 million songwriters. Um, and so when you license with a company like BMI, yes, you're complying with the copyright, but you're also helping support the craft of songwriting because this is primarily how the songwriters make a living. This is how they put food on the table. They have a small business. Their small business is writing songs. They go in every day to try and write that hit song and the fees that you pay play a very important role in their ability to make a living. And who doesn't want music to continue to be created, right? It's the soundtrack of our lives. So thank you for supporting BMI writers. If you do pay BMI fees now, um, just know that those fees are going directly to support songwriting. We have a great partnership with the performing uh, with uh, a, a number of the of the um, restaurant associations um, nationwide. But you know the one we have with PRLNA is special. We've been around. Uh, uh, doing these kinds of agreements for I don't know how many years, but our agreement with the PRLA is something that we're very proud of. You can get a discount off of your fee up to 20% if you're a restaurant and you're a member of the association. And we love to partner with the PRLA on a variety of events that involve our songwriters to make what we do more tangible, uh, more really human. So you understand there is actually someone at the end of the food chain. So we touched on this before, but I really want to dig into it a little bit deeper about what is licensable in your bar, restaurant, hotel, nightclub. Obviously, live music is the number one um, important way that you would uh, need to go to a performing rights organization and seek a license. Live music 100% requires an agreement. DJ, 
you know, some some restaurants, breweries, bars will have DJs perform. That also is licensable and requires an agreement with the performing rights organizations. Karaoke, karaoke as well. Um, television sets. This is the most um, misunderstood part of the copyright law. And understand, this isn't something that we decided. This is something that Congress decided. And that is, when you have a television set on in your bar, or restaurant, or hotel, and you have the audio turned on, you as a business owner are responsible for licensing that, licensing that audio. I know logic would, would, would dictate that, well, if I have an agreement with DirecTV, a commercial license agreement with DirecTV to have that broadcast uh, into my public space, then boy, shouldn't that include the audio? Maybe, but it doesn't. And so if you turn the audio on during an NFL Sunday ticket weekend, um, you're responsible for licensing the music in that audio, whether it's the halftime music, the music in the commercials, episodic music in a television show, um, it's your responsibility. The way you avoid that fee um, is you turn the audio off on your television sets. And so some businesses embrace the audio and think it's an important part of their atmosphere, like a Buffalo Wild Wings. Others, because they know about the copyright implications, will um, tell all their GMs at their respective locations to turn the audio off so that the licensing fees don't kick in. Now, there are streaming services out there that if you are streaming uh, into your bar or restaurant or hotel from a personal account on Spotify or Pandora, then you need a license agreement with the performing rights organizations. Now, there is a big nuanced difference between the streaming services that come from a personal subscription service and from the commercial music services like Pandora for Business or Sirius XM Music for Business or Mood Media. I mean, you know this, it's your business. There are many, many, many background music services that are available. The good news is, is if, if this is the only form of music that you have in your respective business, there's no live music, there's no karaoke, there's no DJs, you do not need to enter into an agreement with BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, GMR, because the commercial music services are paying those fees on your behalf. And so if you have a BMI agreement right now, and the only music you have is through a commercial music service, you're essentially double paying. So you don't want to do that. So uh, just keep that in mind. That does not cover, as I said, live music or any of those other forms of music, only when it's commercial background music and you have a subscription with them uh, and it's licensed for business. Now to the copyright law, it can be big, it can be bad, it can be intimidating if you don't sign a license for music that you're using that is licensable. Um, we do not like to sue businesses. It happens from time to time as a last resort. We try and take a marketing approach to how we license, but sometimes if we get no response and 10 or 12 letters down the road and 10 or 12 phone calls, it starts getting more legalistic. Um, you could potentially get a cease and desist, which is kind of the next step before potential legal action is taken. Uh, we, as I said, we only do this as a last resort because Think about this. We're technically suing our customers, right? Because you're going to continue to use music in the future. Um, so suing you is not an ideal situation for us. However, if we have to, in order to protect our songwriters and publishers as a very, 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 very last resort, we will. And these cases are always settled because uh, any business that goes and hires a copyright attorney finds out the copyright law is pretty black and white. If you have music in your establishment, it's not licensed, um, it's not gonna be a successful outcome for you. Now I ran through this fairly quickly because my experience has been that there's usually a bunch of questions, things I've not touched upon. Um, before I, I open it up for questions, I will say the number one question I get is, do I need a license agreement with all the performing rights organizations? And I touched on this a little bit before. BMI and ASCAP represent the lion's share. BMI and ASCAP songwriters collaborate all the time. So a song that, that, uh, that you might be performing in your business could have been co-written with a BMI songwriter and an ASCAP writer or a CSAC writer. And so it's pretty difficult 
to do without agreements with those performing rights organizations. GMR is pretty high profile. They've got some, as I said, some pretty significant songwriters that they represent, all of which you can find out about on their website. So GMR, if they reach out to you, you most likely need to have a conversation with them. As I mentioned about all track, you know, not as much of a market share and just independent artists that potentially you, you may not need their agreement. But as a whole, you don't want to be in the business of monitoring what these songwriter, singer songwriters and bands are playing uh, because you're in the business of selling food and beverage or rooms and having to monitor that is really hard. I've had some businesses saying, oh, I'm just going to take a license with BMI, which I think is wonderful that you respect BMI as the one that you want to go with. Uh, and our and our our catalog is certainly available for you to look at on the website. But to monitor all of that and you know, try and make sure that a cover band doesn't sneak in a song that's represented by ASCAP or a song that's been co-written by ASCAP, BMI, CSAC songwriters, that can be you know that can be stressful to be worrying about that sort of thing. So most businesses take you know agreements at the very least with BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC. Um, so. That's my number one question, but I'm certainly open to any other issues that you may want to bring up. And hope I'm not sure if this is handled through the chat box or, or how you want to do this. You know, I we usually do chat, but I don't see anything in there. If anybody okay. wanted to open their mic up and ask a question, that that would be fine too. Um, and you know, Dan's email is here, and if you feel like it's something more yeah. private that you don't yeah. really want to put out for the group to hear, that's no problem too. You don't have yeah. to to do that. Uh, I So Donnie Smith asked, how many songs from bands are monitored? How are songs from bands monitored? How is it all monitored? When you, okay, I'm, I'm thinking, and I, I'm not sure when you say monitor, you mean tracked, uh, tracked for royalty distribution? Yes, okay. So what, this is a great question. Um, and it's it's actually really important for you as a business owner to understand it because you can be very helpful to those songwriters that perform in your businesses. So the way that the the lion's share of the of the licensing fees that we collect from the restaurant and hotel industries are paid out is through Shazam technology. Now that Shazam technology, is used to monitor what's being played on radio stations across the country. And we know what Shazam is, right? It, it recognizes the digital footprint in a song. And so it's almost 100% accurate uh, in paying out those royalties. Now, we use that same formula for paying out the money we collect from the restaurants, bars, and hotels. Because right now, even though technology is very advanced, we don't have the technology to monitor all those songs played in a small bar and Montgomery, Alabama, or Allentown, Pennsylvania, right? So we figure what's being played by those cover bands is probably also what's being played on the radio. However, with one big exception, if you've got a singer-songwriter playing at your bar, restaurant, nightclub, hotel, what have you, that's local, doesn't play, uh, has not performed, has not recorded songs, I should say, that have seen national airplay. They're not on the radio. They're only being heard in bars and restaurants in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Obviously, those songs are not going to be picked up in our Shazam data dump, right? Because they're not on the radio. Um, so we created what's called BMI Live. ASCAP has one, CSAC as well. It's an app. And so anytime a songwriter performs at a business that's licensed, they upload that set list to us and we pay them based upon the original songs they performed. So you as a business owner are paying a singer songwriter or a cover band, let's say $500. When you pay them that $500, you're paying them for their performance as artists and musicians. However, if they're playing original songs, when you make sure they fill out their BMI live set list form, they're being paid as songwriters. So what's important about that is if you're paying, you know, $1,000 a year to BMI, you want to make sure that a portion of that $1,000 is going to the local singer songwriter you're trying to support who's affiliated with BMI and is playing originals, maybe in addition to covers when they perform at your business. Um, so I highly recommend that you ask your performers, are you affiliated with BMI or ASCAP or CSAC or what have you? 
and say, if you are and you're playing originals, please make sure that you upload your set list to your performing rights organization so that I can be ensured that when I'm paying BMI my $500 a year, that a portion of that is being directed to you because I want to support you, that local singer songwriter. Um, and that brings up a great question that, that I get a lot too. And that is, well, gee, I don't need a license because um, all of my artists, all my songwriters, all of my bands are playing originals. Well, all songs are originals, right? And I guess what you're, the statement that you're making is that they're not playing other people's music, they're playing their own. But understand that most songwriters, if they've been advised properly, are affiliated with a performing rights organization. It's free to join BMI. So why would you not affiliate with BMI so that they can protect your works when your music is played on YouTube or on Spotify or on the radio or wherever? And so just, you know, make sure that, for example, if you've chosen not to take a license with any of these performing rights organizations under the guise of, well, they're just playing originals, they're not playing covers, make sure you find out from them if they're affiliated with a performing rights organization. Because if they are, then you would need a license. That's interesting. I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions, okay. um, but Dan, thank you so much. This was so great. I love um, hearing you present. I think you do a great job of Thanks. presenting the information that is needed for people to understand music licensing because it can be confusing. Um, and, you know, Dan, I know that you're always there to answer questions if people do have them. Yeah, and feel free. Listen, I, I've worked for BMI for almost 35 years, so I feel like I kind of know the industry pretty well. <laughs> and I don't like to be a BMI infomercial when I speak to you all, when I make these presentations or when I have conversations offline. I want to be able to give you a broad-based look at the music licensing space. So if you have a question, as Hope said, that might be confidential or, gee, I got contacted by Alltrack the other day or GMR, what do I do? What do I say? How do I handle it? Um, feel free to reach out to me. I, I would hope that at this stage of my career, I could be more of a consultant than necessarily a salesperson for BMI. I'm, I'm there to try and make sure you understand the whole landscape and to give you advice about all aspects of it. So thank you, Hope. And oh, there is a there, Wait, looks like there's, there is one more question. Actually, yeah. Does BMI and uh, it says, et cetera, and I, I think he means um, the other organizations have overlapping artists. Now, you cannot affiliate with more than one performing rights organization. It, you're prohibited from being a member of a number of them. You're, you're either ASCAP, you're either BMI. It, you sign a contract when you first affiliate. That contract is good for a, a year. It's a self-renewing agreement. A songwriter can, can change uh, affiliations if they want. They just need to notify BMI or ASCAP or whatever performing rights organization they're affiliated with during a, uh, the appropriate period of time. There's like a window during the course of the year when they can say, hey, I, I, I want to terminate my agreement with BMI. Um, and then it will terminate at the end of that calendar year. And they are then free to affiliate with another PRO. But uh, no, you can't be members of both. Right. Another great question. <laughs> yeah, it's a very good question. I, I, uh, I get that a lot. Um, and it's important to understand that. Well, we have recorded this and we'll send this out. Okay. Um, but uh, thank you again, Dan, for coming on. Um, you're always a wealth of knowledge and we appreciate all your support. Well, we love our partnership. You guys are amazing. Um, as I said, there's no more professional restaurant association, lodging association in the country. So please give my best to Joe and the rest of the team. And um, I'll look forward to hopefully seeing you down the road, Hope. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, okay. Dan. Thanks to everybody for joining us today. Bye.